Hi guys, I want to share my 2000 round PSA AR9 review. Um, this is going to be a little bit futile in that in a lot of ways I'm reviewing the AR platform in general um, and PCCs in particular are also an entirely controversial subject. So for the most part, I think I'm going to get a lot of uh, shade thrown at me regardless of what I say here. but. Um, at least this is not going to be uh, like a four minute review saying it's a good shooter, um, you know, buy one or something like that. Oh, I found it fun or it's okay or something. You're going to get real experiences and data from, from what I'm about to say. And uh, especially with the PSA AR9s, there's quite a lot of options. It's like for Frank and AR9s, there's a lot of options out there. And hopefully I can steer you to, to a few good things. And um, perhaps address a few things like last round bolt hold open, which seems to be the main reason people uh, steer clear of the PSA AR9s. Uh, and so we'll get to that shortly. Um, this is going to be relatively long, um, so I'm going to throw timestamps in the description below so you can get to sections that you might find more relevant for yourself. So, uh, why PCC? So, this is more competition focused question. I'm a big fan of multi-sport division. So the PCC is a is a division in IDPA, USPSA, and actually most multi-gun sports to allow you to shoot the multi-gun event with only a PCC. So if you buy any gun and you want to get into competition, PCC will allow you to shoot anything that you show up to pretty much. Except for obviously PRS or something like that, not doing long range shooting with this thing. Um, so that's really awesome. So you've only got one set of skills to train and you can go across to every match and obviously there's scoring differences, but your, your rig set up and the way you set up your rifle is going to be the same for all of them. Um, I'm a big fan of these multi-sport divisions because I like going to these competitions. I don't really care which rule set's happening. It's, you know, it's all part of the fun. Um, so what can I say? I think the PCC is the, the, the ultimate multi-division uh, gun. A great way to start off because you don't have to do things like uh, reload on the clock as much like the other divisions and the setup is the same. You don't have to worry about holsters and positions and stuff like that. I personally want to get into PCC um, to increase my rifle skills. So when I started, uh, my rifle skills were far lagging behind my pistol skills. And that's kind of odd, you know, it should be a platform that you're, you're able to pick up and easily use, but I was definitely far better at pistol. I wanted to get into three gun so I needed to pick up some of those rifle skills. I thought, hey, let's use the local club match just that I do for USPSA and IDPA to get the, those skills in. Um, there is also benefits of shooting PCC, even if you are a pistol shooter. Um, obviously, the, the shooting components of a stage are made easier with a rifle. Um, however, the shooting component of a stage is going to be a very minor portion of the stage in totality, unless it's like a qualifier or something like that. So classifier. Um, so there are things like footwork, stage plan, execution, visual speed. Um, these are all things that, that carry over from PCC in, in, in general. So I think you can improve your pistol skills by moving to PCC. However, um, shooting is a perishable um, skill. So, you know, your dry fire practice would have to be doubled in that case. So if you decided to shoot PCC, there are a few platforms that are competitive out there. Um, you have three main options, uh, SIG MPX and uh, a G JP Rifle, GMR-13. You know, they're, they're both seen as being the out-of-the-box guns that are competing at the top. And then you have the option of going Frank and AR-9. Basically, it's an AR-9. You start off with it and maybe it's completely built from scratch or you start off something like a PSA or something slightly better. Um, and then you turn it into what you ultimately want. I, I think the problem with the SIG MPX is parts availability and price. Even if you go for the SIG MPX PCC, you're looking at $1,600. And a lot of that has been put into the, the stock, the handguard, and the uh, trigger group, I believe, has been upgraded slightly. However, for, for $1,600, you'd still want uh, the stock that you, you genuinely want. So you're talking about getting the $150 M4 stock adapter, maybe $70 for the actual stock that you want. You're still get, probably going to put on a, a different grip. Um, so that's another $20. You're 
you're probably still going to end up putting in a hyper fire in there so it's another 207 dollars so you're in by two thousand two hundred dollars and i haven't even started the mags yet and then the parts available the sig mpx i think if you've got money to spend you really love this division it is the ultimate pcc at the end of the day after you spent like two and a half thousand dollars maybe it is the ultimate pcc You've then got the GMR 13. Um, I think that's also 13, 1400 dollars. It's probably a little more ready out of the box than the the Sig MPX. However, um, you're still probably going to replace that trigger with an actual hyperfire. It's another 275 dollars um, or 220, depending on which one you got. Um, and you're still going to you're still going to play around. It. It'll end up being a Franken AR9. So for me, I think. You should start with a Franken AR9 and you shouldn't start from scratch. I mean, there's a lot to learn, so why not just spend the $560 to get the, the PSA? So since I advocate for a basic AR9 uh, for competition shooting, um, just to start off with, unless you already know you, you, you're going to try to kill the division, like right out of the gate, you're already a GM at something, and then so you want to be a GM at PCC. Okay, that's this video is not for you. Um, so basic criteria, reliability. Can it cycle a wide variety of factory ammo if you're doing factory? Um, if you're loading on your own, I don't think there's going to be any issue. Um, however, reliability with hollow points not a thing. I'm not picking this thing up for home defense. Maybe it will load hollow points. So TACCOM make a um, PCC uh, feed ramp. Um, so that'll enhance it. So that there's nothing special about the PSA in this regard about feeding or not feeding hollow points. Like I know the CMMG stuff, they don't feed hollow points reliably as well. You're going to need that. It's like a $20 part and that, that might help. I don't know if it gets there, but it's just not a competition thing. I'm not using SD loads, self-defense loads for competition. Uh, ergonomics. So it's a AR9 platform. The main thing you're, you're really considering is whether or not hand guards are any good. And tunability. Um, is it a platform that you can grow with? So is it like super proprietary? Like the CMMGs are sort of uh, middle of the road proprietary. You know, they're, they're, they're very good at supplying their parts and a lot of their parts are compatible and, and other uppers and all this stuff like that. So it's not too bad. So things that aren't competition criteria. Um, the biggest one that I hear all the time, especially on gun deals on the Reddit or sub forum is like, oh, I, I want to buy it, but it doesn't have last round bolt hold open. <sighs> I, I don't know what to say about this. The the last round bolt hold, hold open thing is if you're just using it at the range, um, I I don't know why last round bolt hold open would be a serious issue for you. Um, it's a convenience thing, but you're at the range. You're just having fun anyway. I mean, just load the rifle again. In competition, I could see how it could be a minor advantage. Um, in competition... If you didn't have things like 51 round mags, which exceed the maximum round count for a, for st potential stages or face by by 20 rounds, uh, open shooters generally don't have last round bolt hold open, and they've got less rounds in their mag. They all they typically on the large field stage will reload once. The amount of times anybody is slide lock reloading in USPSA is just it just doesn't happen. And in IDPA, okay, yeah, slide lock reload, it, it's required. However, you're allowed a 30 round magazine max in IDPA and the max round count for a stage is 18. So you've, you've even got greater margin in IDPA stage compared to USPA stage, even just using regular Glock mag. So I, I honestly think that if you, you re a lot of people need to let go of the last round bolt hold open, it really isn't a big deal. Um, and even if you, you really, really must have last round bolt hole open, then the AR9 Glock platform really isn't the platform for you. So you can see where the, the tab is on a Glock and it engages up front here and the, the bolt hold open is back here. So there are ways that they that certain lowers have jury or uppers of jury rigged getting LRBHO uh, working, but I've also heard complaints that they don't work. And I suspect that PSA had so many issues with their Gen 1, which did do LRBHO, um, that they just said, let's let's get rid of it. Because it just doesn't work reliably, full stop. The Glock followers and Glock mags were never made uh, to try and lock back an AR. If you must have LRBHO, they do sell uh, Colt mag compatible. 
Colts have a follower that will engage on the rear and um, the mag catches on the rear. So it, it's far more reliable in terms of LRBHO. But from a competition perspective, I, I don't think there's any real issue with um, not having an LRBHO. Um, from any other perspective, range perspective, I don't see the big deal of reloading after you've, you've clicked one more time. Nobody says the MP5 is terrible because it have LRBHO. From a home defense perspective, if you're shooting beyond 33 rounds, the do you have another big stick? It's up to you. I mean, my criteria is a competition. I just don't think LRBHO is, is a big deal. The other not for competition criteria um, is self-defense round compatibility. So a lot of the self-defense rounds are both hollow point and uh, have a lot hotter power. Even if they're not plus P, they tend to be much stronger regardless. And um, I've already talked about hollow points. Um, I don't know anything about it. I don't use them for competition. Factory ammo, I've, I've rarely seen factory ammo with um, considerable hollow points on them at good prices anyway. I mean, I know you can get, can get mild hollow points and I'd say they probably would cycle. I would just avoid them for the AR9. There's plenty of factory rounds out there that don't have it. Um, if you must, um, as I said, for hollow points, the TACCOM make a, a feed ramp that might help. Um, but I'll get into one of the, the failures I experienced with regards to using hotter rounds. So I think SD rounds may present a, a specific problem, but I've got the remedy for that too. So stay tuned. So why PSA AR9? Um, so in my experience, uh, so 2000 rounds down, um, it works. Uh, that, that's the main thing. It works. Um, and you don't have to do any homework. So you buy it, you stick Glock mags in it shoot almost any factory ammo, at least in my testing, 17 different types of factory ammo, they all worked. Um, and allows you to try before investing in anything. You, you can spend a lot of money on AR9s out of the box or um, extending. So you say, oh, I want this lower, this upper, you know, specific components with your Franken build. Um, and I just think starting off with a basic build, and even if you are replacing components, so you can see I've eventually started replacing components like oh okay i replaced the plastic mag thing okay this is a 20 dollars upgrade am i really saving am i really wasting money with uh having to replace like a probably a one dollar part with a 20 dollar part by just paying 20 dollars immediately um i did eventually replace the buffer and i'm like oh i paid for conceptually i paid for a buffer as part of this package and uh, that, that's, you know, I spent $30 on the other buffer, so maybe I I'd lost $5 there. But I didn't really lose anything. I might even go back to that buffer. I mean, the parts that I've replaced, like the trigger, for instance, I keep in my range bag. A lot of the parts that you exchange the AR9 for, you're usually making some kind of trade-off somewhere, and there might actually be a good reason to go back. Like the, um, the Hyperfire, it's probably not as reliable as the mil spec trigger at least it's more likely to break my firing pin and if i'm experiencing that guess what i'm gonna switch out the firing pin and then also potentially switch back to a mil spec for the rest of the match or something so the reality is like i i don't think there's a false economy being built by buying a basic cheap you know full complete package um as your starting point even if you do replace almost all of the parts um, those parts will probably follow you in your range bag for every single match. What is my uh, PSA AR9? So some parts are replaced, I'll go into detail for that, but for the 2000 rounds, um, the configuration is almost completely stock. I'll, I'll, as I said, I'll make points as to where they weren't. So mine is a 16 inch in, in these games, US PSA and, and uh, IDPA, they require that you have a rifle. I'm not gonna do an SBR. You kind of want a 13.5 or a 15 inch handguard regardless. You tend to want to do a C clamp of, you know, a pointy finger out here, you index it so that you look, you look cool, um, mainly. And then you get sort of pain in your wrist as you keep your hand in that awkward position. Um, so this is the Gen 3 uh, lower and the upper doesn't seem to change too much. So starting from the front, um, so this represents a bit of a buyer's guide with regards to um, PSA and your options out there right now. Uh, up the front, 
almost all of them are bird cage. Some of the pistol range have the CAC flash can. I'd suggest the CAC flash can if you're doing something very short. Bird cage is fine. Um, you may end up upgrading that to a, um, a comp for yourself at some point. Most of the competition consensus is that comps on 9mm, especially after this distance, don't really do anything, um, but it looks cool. Uh, stainless steel barrel. I think between stainless steel and your other options, 4150 nitrided. Uh, 4150 nitrided, uh, as, as a general rule, is is tougher than stainless steel. Stainless steel is meant to offer um, more precision because it takes the cuts of the rifling a lot a lot better. Um, however, I think in 9mm, it's ultimately a cosmetic choice. I don't think barrel life is going to be a big issue on, on 9mm velocities versus 4150 um, nitrided. Um, so just pick the one that looks coolest to you. I think the stainless steel barrel looks cool. You can pick the nitride one because black, 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 it looks cool too. Um, handguard. So this is the newer quote unquote lightweight handguard. I'll show you the other option that's floating about. Although they don't often have this available in the 15 or 13 anymore. They seem to be phasing out. So this is the original handguard. So this is an AR-15, but this is the original M-Lock handguard, free float handguard. And you can see it's got the monolithic rail up top. And it's, that's actually skeletonized out as well. Um, so this thing's actually reasonably lightweight, but with the top rail on top and these edges are actually quite sharp. So the hand feel on these I find is not that great. Um, I prefer using gloves on this. The new quote unquote lightweight um, handguard, as you can see, the skeletonization is a little cool with the triangles there, but the edges are much softer. And so I find that it's a lot with, I don't need gloves for this. It, I'm not, it doesn't feel like I would ever cut my hand on this particular handguard while on the other one, it's definitely a cheese grater. Um, it doesn't have a monolithic rail. Um, I'm guessing that's to save weight, but I think there was another review showing that you take these off and weigh them. Um, there is actually like one ounce of difference between the two and this one might even be heavier, but you will have the option. I definitely suggest that this is the one to get is the lightweight handguard. 13.5 or 15 are uh, completely fine. I think 10.5 might be a little short. I mean, this is where the 10.5 would come in at. And so it, it would be doable, but I don't think there's any real reason to skimp out on that. Completing the upper is the bolt. Uh, I believe they're all the GF4 now. Um, the, the gas block, which doesn't take any gas, is still uh, a secondary component of the bolt. I have seen some bolts where it's uh, monolithic and that would be better. However, the, the I'm sure these are perfectly fine and gas isn't running through these anyway. It has an AR-15 style extractor, so internal extractor. I think in previous generations, it was a less reliable system where it wasn't part of the bolt carrier. This is quite a heavy piece, um, heavier than an AR-15 uh, bolt carrier group and that's important because of blowback system. Um, they do have, as you can see here, the roll pin and weight. So this, this is actually a part that can be removed. So you can drift this out and then remove the weight here. Um, I would suggest to you that is not necessary in most people's condition, but it does offer tunability. So this is um, a good feature ultimately, but I think most people won't use it. Um, this is important if you're going to use the JP rifle silent uh, spring system, basically because it's a captured system. There's a rod that actually goes into what expect it expects to be the cavity of the... If you're going to be adjusting the weight of your recoil system, you'll want to adjust that using buffers and not the bolt carrier group. And the last thing on an upper is the charging handle. No, it doesn't come with a Strike Industries uh, extended latch charging handle. It comes with a mil-spec charging handle. I would suggest upgrading that immediately. You can do an entire video on charging handles. I like the SI one, it's only 30 bucks. It's got a really nice big handle on it. it, looks cool. I've got Raptors as well. I don't like them as much as this actually, so. So moving on with the lower, this is a uh, Gen 3 lower. Um, you still have the option of Gen 3 lowers and there are also Gen 4 lowers. Um, starting with the trigger group, um, you will get a mil-spec trigger group and 
the main options there are some packages come with the EPT trigger group, which I think is a nickel boron coated null spec trigger group. I totally advise getting that as far as I can tell. It's just a clean upgrade. It's a better trigger group than the one that they, stand, they ship standard. Still have the mil spec trigger here, and this is what I shot 2000 rounds with. Now, so with the mil spec trigger, and the reason you hear about a lot of things with AR9s and trigger groups is that when the hammer comes back, it slams that hammer back really, really fast, and that, that builds up speed, and it has to be absorbed by something, and it isn't going to be the mainspring that slows it down. It is going to collide with the rest of the trigger group, and the mainspring collides uh, here. Uh, let's see if we get that in. The mainspring collides here, and you can see that it's like it's absolutely beating the crap out of that disconnector, but it is far from breaking. So, so the mil spec trigger is very, very reliable, and it did did not break on me in the 2000 rounds and it was not the source of any issues in 2000 rounds and i'm sure that thing could probably go on for another 10,000 rounds yeah it's it's taking damage but um considering how big that disconnector is gonna take a long time for that thing to actually um be damaged in any specific way um but as i said i would absolutely go for the ept um if you've got that option in the package you're about to get because spec uh mil spec safety but i just put in the seekins because i like the 60 degree mil specs perfectly fine in some ways the mil specs actually smoother than this a little chunky right now moving to the buffer and spring system i don't know what spring actually is inside that thing um, but it comes with one of these it is unmarked but at 5.6 ounces this is heavier than an h3 buffer so this is the that's the heaviest buffer you can get for an ar15 carbine um, so this corresponds with a, basically a 9mm PCC buffer of some type. So it's slightly heavier than H3. So PSA have totally supplied the, you know, the most reliable buffer system for this. So it's a, it's a relatively heavy bolt carrier group or bolt itself and a PCC um, 5.6 ounce buffer. The, the other thing with buffers and springs is this ends up being the area where the most tuning is available on the AR9 platform. Uh, I'll go into a little later what I've, what I've done here with regards to one of the failures I experienced. But one of the biggest upgrades that you can do is throwing about 12 quarters in the back of the spring here. So you put the quarters into your buffer tube. So you put your spring in and then your buffer. And it will get you to the point where the bolt only cycles back just enough to engage the mag catch and not further. On the 556, it's uh, necessary to go a little bit further back, but on the 9mm, um, you just want it just that little bit further back. So what that'll do is it'll shorten up the cycle time. The Obviously, the spring will have had less chance to decelerate the bolt, so it might increase the amount of felt recoil in favor of reducing the cycle time. Uh, it's up to you whether or not you enjoy it. I didn't see any significant change in um, reliability. I didn't see any change in reliability, but I did see an improvement in terms of, um, from my, my perspective, uh, dot movement. So the faster cycle time certainly helped, and the speed at which the bolt uh, arrives back onto the barrel is going to be a lot slower as well, because it doesn't have as much uh, travel distance to actually accelerate the bolt into the barrel. So uh, Palmetto State Armory supply a lot of different configurations for their lowers. So I'll get into Gen 3 and Gen 4 in just a second. Um, obviously stock and grip are going to be, you know, mil-spec tubes and mil-spec um, engagement here. So I'm a big, big fan of the Moe SL. Um, I definitely like any stock that has this section here. The MFT Battle Link will also be good. This shipped with a CAC blade because I bought it as a pistol. Um, Personally, I think if you're buying AR platform, you always want that ability to go with a shorter barrel and then switch out to a, a brace system of some type. Um, so I would never buy the lower and upper together. I know I had a comment, um, someone looking at getting uh, a PCC before 1639 here in Washington, which has extra restrictions on semi-automatics. Um, just don't buy it as a semi-automatic, just buy it as a lower. And in, in Washington, and as well as everywhere else, it doesn't matter how built the lower is. So obviously, um, PSA supply the lower in 
in in build configurations but not barrels still just the lower so it'll have a pistol stabilizing brace or it'll have a stock on it it still remains other none of these even if it came with the stock it would not be a rifle on the form um, so hence for 1639 Washington in particular it would still not be a rifle even if it came with a stock um, I'm a big fan of the K2 grips. None of the packages come with the K2 grip as far as I know. So moving into the lower. Um, so as I said, there's a Gen 3 lower. This is mostly a new Frontier Armoury clone. That's a good thing from the perspective that you get a lot more options for aftermarket parts. I believe Gen 1 through 3 are compatible with this. The XGMR1 extended, um, extended uh, mag catch. Um, that being said, the mag catch it comes with is absolutely terrible. And we'll go into the failure section. Um, the fact that there is aftermarket is good. The fact that the thing it comes with is does barely works is not so good. So take that how you see it. Um, I'll get into another failure I saw and it all had to do with this particular ejector. Um, this is the only one that I've actually found um, spare ejectors for the Gen 3 there's New Frontier Armoury compatible basically this is a New Frontier Armoury um, ejector um, that I put in there myself after I lost the first ejector I'll, say I'll go into that but um, going into the Gen 4 the Gen 4 seems to use uh, a roll pin to hold the ejector as opposed to set screws and I think that'll be a much more secure system so I don't think there's any need to, to have aftermarket parts available. I think the ejector is good to go and the way it's locked in is good to go. While this is with set screws, I think that's really poor. Um, and then on the Gen 4, the mag catch looks like a completely different mag catch. So it's more likely to work, but at the same time, I don't believe there are any aftermarket replacements for the Gen 4 mag catch if it doesn't work. So I can't review that. I do not have the Gen 4. It looks good. It looks like metal to me. But even if it was plastic, to me, that would be an advantage. I really waited for a very long time to persevere with the plastic one um, in hope that it would survive because you've pl Glock mags are all plastic at this uh, section here. And I don't like metal things engaging plastic things in general. I've seen Sinistral Rifleman damage his Glocks and he just says mags are consumables. I... I don't think mags are consumables, especially with you know so many states with so many mag bans. I don't like the idea of having a firearm that will knowingly chew up mags. I haven't seen it with this. I would be happier if this had like say a plastic component that actually engaged the mag. So in general, I, I think the Gen 4 lower is likely more reliable, but probably has less uh, parts available. So. There's a trade-off there. I think the trade-offs are probably going to end up being equal. In terms of mag funnel, I haven't done that to mine yet, but Gen 1 through 3 all have mag funnels available, but they're all like 3D printed. So it's not like um, there's like a large uh, factory option available. There's a guy in Brian Eno's forums that whips them up to order. Um, so I think the Gen 4 is likely going to be just fine. It looks like the same dimensions as Gen 3 at the magwell anyway. So with regards to reliability on this thing, I um, had a total of five failures of different types, all of them diagnosed. None of them are problems that are, like say, persistent or would continue. Um, and two are problems that would have happened on any AR9 or any platform if they had similar problems. I had no cycling issues on 17 different factory ammos that I tried. That's the, I'll put a list down below. Um, I haven't seen a single uh, load. Uh, I haven't tried hollow points, but I haven't seen a single load that this thing didn't cycle. So in my book, that's very, very reliable. Um, that being said, um, let's get into the exact uh, individual failures I'm talking about. So failure number one is... Uh, ammo induced and I believe this would have happened with any AR9 um, using mil spec uh, well not mil spec, standard components um, is this stuff Winchester white box uh, NATO let's see here Winchester white box NATO 
the problem with Winchester White Box NATO and when I was running it and um, it cycled fine. Let's get out of the way first. This stuff cycled. Um, is that there's a there's a, a warning in here in super small text. You can see that. And most warnings on firearm stuff are just complete, you know, legalese stuff, you know, just cover their ass stuff. But this says, the use only in modern 9mm firearms in good condition. These cartridges are loaded to military velocity and pressure. Average pressure is 10 to 15% higher than industry standard pressure for 9mm Luger. So this technically puts it right into the plus p category i think consensus it's somewhere between plus p and uh and regular so it's it's hot it's really hot for factory ammo the bolt cycles back it cycles back based on you know the the blowback from the system there's no delay or anything like that it pulls back and it cycles the hammer down so the hammer comes down and it slams into the disconnector of the um, of the trigger group and so where does that energy go so it goes into the disconnector as you can see my disconnector is still perfectly fine um, it goes through the trigger pin and into the receiver did my receiver broke no nope, receivers fine what it did do is it broke the trigger pin so this is the trigger pin it broke after somewhere around 200 rounds um, so yeah, it broke. I, I don't think this would have be, this would have survived in any other rifle set up the same way. It's just physics. There's a mil spec um, parts on that trigger group. So there are a couple ways that I researched into how could I make this reliable, even taking you know very very hot rounds. So the main thing is is you got to slow down this bolt. So how fast it's slamming into the buffer. One way you could do it is by increasing the spring weight of the buffer. However, that's an acceleration force, or in this case, it'd be a deceleration force. And the starting speed is still going to be the same. And all of the hammer engagement is in the first inch of engagement from the bolt. So I think even if you went with very heavy springs, you're going to start running into things like short cycling and... Um, and it's slamming back into the barrel very, very fast. Next thing you can do is strengthen the trigger, trigger pins. So I don't know what mil spec trigger pins are made of, um, but S7 tool steel would be ideal. I'm guessing they're not made of that in general um, because they're not using blowback in general AR-15. Um, so if you could find S7 tool steel, that would be great. The best I could find are these titanium ones. These were $9. Um, titanium is strong, but um, steel can be stronger. So if you, you found some steel trigger pins or advertising being extra strong, it, it might be the case. It might be the case. The biggest difference is going to be uh, increasing the weight of the total system. So I've increased the weight of the total system here by using uh, Palmetto State Armory's 8 ounce buffer. So their 8 ounce buffer is extra long. So those 12 quarters that I talked about are now basically a component of the buffer itself. So um, I've only got one quarter in the back here and I'm using the 8 ounce buffer. So it's an increase of 2.4 ounces. It doesn't sound like much, but it's an increase of weight of 20%. So it means it's slowing down the bolt by 20%. And uh, I've noticed that the ejection prior to using the uh, extra long, extra heavy PSA PCC buffer um, was somewhere around like 10 plus yards in terms of ejection of the shells. And then once you've I've put in the extra heavy buffer, um, the ejection is more like pistol ranges where you know, it's like three or four yards, something like that. So it's, I think with, with those measures in place, you could probably take the... I have no issue with taking the NATO rounds anymore and I don't fear breakage in, in that respect. The downside to doing those reliability upgrades is I don't think increasing the weight of the buffer um, helps with felt recoil, um, but I haven't done extensive testing. I think the ultimate in terms of tuning, and I'm not, I haven't started doing any recoil tuning, would be um, reducing the weight of the total recoil system as much as possible, and then tuning the, um, tuning the spring 
such that it cycles fine and returns the the bolt to the barrel with the least amount of uh, force possible so you're not getting a, you know a, a drop on the nose when you when it cycles cycle is complete um, the trade-off to that is you make it too light and you're just putting way faster bolts onto the trigger group and the rest of the system that's eventually going to destroy the your platform i don't know what's going to break next if you're not breaking triggers there'll be something else but if you start breaking triggers then um at that point you're going to be fed up and you'll probably put more weight back into the buffer system failure number two was uh miss misfeeds from the goliath so this is 100 percent this thing um that was my second set of failures no other magazine i had any kind of failure zero just zero this with certain types of ammo unfortunately most types of ammo loaded to 51 rounds uh will not lo load reliably um it's really that simple i've searched around uh taylor freelance uh say that you got to find factory ammo that is 1.125 inches and below um in my testing and i'll share details below I only found one factory ammo out of 17 that didn't exceed this number. So the idea that this is an odd occurrence that Winchester White Box 115 is the only one to cause problems, I just don't think it's the case. Um, and ultimately, I did find a, a load that they recommend, which is a Fiocchi 124 grain 9 APB. It is at 1.15 uh, in inches overall length, which is very standard, very very average for the group of factory ammos. So it isn't the overall length that is causing the hang up. Um, it is basically 50 is a lot and the friction and material and shape of the bullets can affect whether or not it's getting jammed up after just this length of, of magazine. Failure number three happened on my second outing about 200 rounds in and this is the ejector, and it just went missing. I fired a shot, didn't cycle, wouldn't eject. I'm like, hmm, something's wrong with the ejector. I go, this thing's, the whole thing's missing. I couldn't even find it on the ground. I couldn't pick it up and put it back in or anything. It was just gone. Um, put witness marks on the set screws that hold it in. The only thing holding the ejector in is friction from the set screws. It doesn't actually go through the ejector. It's friction from the set screws. So I put that thing back on the red Loctite and it survived about 2,000 rounds now with that red Loctite in place. Still round counts up to 2,200. Um, but I didn't find that ejector. So that, that's scary, to be honest. Like when you find a small part to your gun missing um, <laughs> and it's quite, quite critical to the functionality. The Gen 3, as I said, is a clone of the NFA, um, uh, New Frontier Armory. I got a replacement from Optics Planet within two days. Um, I said Loctite that thing down it hasn't been a problem since as I said with the Gen 4 it looks like it's held in with a roll pin so it probably likely goes through the actual uh, ejector so that's unlikely to be a problem but that being said I've not seen replacements for that particular ejector anywhere so um, ultimately you'll want a good warranty on that and the good thing about PSA though is, is that all their firearms are warranted for life so if something goes wrong with that ejector, I imagine that you shouldn't really have any trouble with it. Failure number four, uh, handguard came loose. So the handguard is held on just with friction onto the barrel nut here. And these set screws tighten down and they provide that friction. After a very long day of shooting with very hot ammo, um, the handguard developed a gap here, about a quarter inch gap. Um, so I just undid the screws, put it back on, tightened it up. Uh, when I got home, I made sure those, those were all Loctited. So if you get one of these, so that didn't even cost me a stage. What well, didn't induce a malfunction, but you know, you, I did have to be aware of it and I did fix it. Um, if you get one of these, I would just look at any of the screws that are on this thing. And it really isn't that much. And just make sure they're locked tighter. Just go in there, make sure you understand what, what function that they fulfill and, and lock tight it down. Uh, failure number five is the mag catch. So this is the, the aftermarket mag catch. 
The one it comes with is plastic. And I don't think the issue is that it's plastic. Like I, I would prefer that it was plastic. Uh, I prefer the XGMR was plastic um, because I don't think metal mag catch on plastic mags is such a great idea in the long term. However, it did not work. Now, what do I mean by did not work? It was very hard to seat mags in. So it would prevent the mag from even entering the funnel um, because of the way the, the engagement was. It would, once they were past the funnel, it would fail to hold the mags in. So sometimes the mag catch would actually be caught on the body of the receiver and not actually engage the mag, even though it was fully seated, and keep the mag in. So it would uh, prevent mags from entering fail to retain mags, it would also then fail to um, uh, eject mags after you, you've pressed it. That one, not so much, but it definitely would. So everything that the mag catch is meant to do, it rarely did the right thing. So if you go through a procedure where you need to load, unload, reload, so if you go through basically a, a, a speed reload, it would cost me half a second every single time I did it. Either it was like it was still holding onto the mag or it was the first mag wouldn't enter in or wouldn't lock it just it did not work this xgmr1 is a fantastic 30 dollars spent the installation was easy it's not a um roll pin it's just a set screw and um psa even make an extended uh extended mag catch available for there there as well as 20 dollars. so it's it's a cheap upgrade i went with the xgmr1 just because i see other shooters with it it looks cool it's red it's cool so an extra $10 there, um, but a fantastic um, replacement for what otherwise I'd consider just a complete failure of that original mag catch. So final evaluation of PSA AR9 from a competitive shooting perspective as a basic AR9 setup as in getting into the sport. Um, my criteria, as I said, was reliability, ergonomics, and tunability. Um, so in terms of reliability, the fact that I've never had issues with rounds um, is amazing to me. I've seen a lot of AR9s with a lot of problems um, and I simply have not experienced consistent problems. So I've had the specific failures I've, I've, I've showed you all easily diagnosed and all of them permanently addressable. Um, so out, on a reliability perspective, I would still give this a four out of five Right now, it's to me, it's like a 5 out of 5, but from a buying experience, it's a 4 out of 5 because I did experience those failures. Those did happen, um, but right now, like this couldn't get more reliable, um, so I'm very happy right now. I'd say the, the things that PSA need to do better is that the extractor need a Loctite from the factory. I think they've done actually one better on that. The Gen 4s now are, are roll pinned in, so that's not an issue. Um, the handguard lockdown could be better so it isn't just that they're not loctited as you can see here those two are flush and i think no amount of extra pressure from the screws will actually get the handguard on tighter i haven't had it come loose since i've loctited it but the possibility remains i think they that i'm not exactly sure what's happening there um that could end up coming loose again but as I said, it never got loose to the point where like it just fell off or something like that and cost me a stage. It's never cost me a stage, and I don't think it ever will. Um, but it is something that I will continue to keep an eye on. Um, in terms of ergonomics, um, since this is a uh, mil-spec lower effectively from the perspective of your handguard, trigger group position, and stock, I think it's par excellence. I don't think anyone disagrees that the AR-15 is the best platform um, in terms of ergonomics. I mean, okay, we're going to get some comments, but <laughs> you have your options. Uh, in terms of handguard, this new lightweight handguard is fantastic. Um, it could be lighter, but in terms of actual feel, it's fantastic. And the M-Lock is, is perfect. I've never had to readjust this particular thing here. Everything just works fantastically. In terms of tunability, this is really just, I guess, an evaluation of AR9 in general. Um, I wanted to tune this for reliability. It cost me $20 to perform that upgrade. Simple as that. So in terms of tunability, it's fantastic. Obviously, the next 2,000 rounds, I've got the Hyperfire trigger in. We'll see how that goes. Um, but tunability is, is right up there. Everything 
is well researched there's lots of forums talking about ar9s and what to do and like the quarters trick like i said before um so overall in each category i give everything a uh, four out of five so reliability as i said diagnosable issues it could be better out of the box but right now for me it couldn't be better ergonomics four out of five um i think the that the overall package could be a little lighter weight tunability four out of five um nothing is that proprietary but it is an ar15 level like five out of five would be ar15 ar9 is about four out of five so next 2000 rounds um i'm going to be using the hyperfi trigger which with the 2.5 uh, pound uh setup is known to break firing pins so i'm just going to run 3.5 it's still highly highly value reliability i will always carry a spare trigger pin just in case uh following that um i'll probably start looking a little bit more into recoil tuning so perhaps dropping down from the um the extra heavy buffer and just not run super heavy super uh, hot loads anymore um and then probably looking at the blitzkrieg works hydraulic buffer um so that looks like a system that could actually take some of the the hardest snaps on the dot um, and reduce those to like soft movements while while keeping the cycle time down all right so there's a lot of things in there that were opinions um, and I'm, there may be details that you would like to clarify so please leave comments below i will answer anything that i possibly can um, a lot of sections in here uh, are really just touching the surface of what could be entire long videos on their own. Um, so if there's a particular video you want me to prioritize, uh, please let me know. But uh, I hope I clarified a lot of details on getting into AR9s and specifically PSA AR9s. All right, thank you. And as always, uh, like and subscribe.